Uh, welcome everyone to uh, CA Associates Top 10 Post-Processing E-Learning Tips in ASS Mechanical. Uh, we'll be your host today, uh, I'm Pat Cunningham, and with me is uh, Dr. Mike Bach. Hello. There we go. Okay, just some uh, quick background on CA Associates. Uh, we are an engineering consulting firm in uh, Middlebury, Connecticut, and we specialize in both FDA, CFD analysis, and we're now also uh, capable in the uh, EMAG environment. Uh, we've been an ASSIS channel partner since 1985, providing sales and support uh, to customers in our region. The presentation today is part of a series of our e-learning webinars. Uh, you can view our previous e-learning sessions because we record them all. Uh, either They can be found either on our website under the e-learning section or you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, search for CAE Associates, and you'll see the entire list of the webinars that we've done to date. Uh, if you go on the website, you may also uh, be able to download a PowerPoint script uh, of the presentation. Uh, so if it's a demonstration of a particular item, uh, you will see the step-by-step -step, um, breakdown of how that particular technique was demonstrated. Uh, if you are a New York or New Jersey resident and you're looking to earn continuing education credits, uh, you can, we can provide them if you attend the full webinar and complete a survey afterwards, which will be emailed to you. Also on our website, we continuously are adding to our resource library. Uh, this would include things like consulting case studies, uh, seminar and conference presentations, and various um, like update seminar presentations. Uh, one other area that's uh, growing is useful macros and scripts. This also includes uh, ACT extensions for the workbench environment. And again, these are available uh, to be downloaded off of our website. We've been working steadily on our engineering blog, our engineering advantage blog, and we uh, encourage you to go check it out. It's, uh, it's not ANSYS specific, it's more uh, general fun and element type discussions. Um, and here's one for an example that was just re recently written by Peter Barrett, do I need to hire an FEA export expert? Uh, instead of actually going to the blog today, we'll, we'll just give you the Reader's Digest summary on that, which is basically, yes, you, you should hire the associates for that, because we are an engineering consulting firm. So, uh, but no, in all seriousness, uh, there's lots of interesting topics and techniques that are discussed on a weekly basis on our blog, uh, and we're uh, always eager to uh, answer questions and comments uh, with respect to the posted items. So you can still hire us. You can still hire us, so yeah. Okay, uh, if you're interested in training from C Associates, uh, you'll find our training schedule on the, web, on the website also, uh, and you can also register for training uh, directly on the site. So, on to today's topic. Uh, this presentation is a continuation of our top 10 e-learning series, uh, helpful tips that you uh, can utilize when you are, are working in ANSYS Mechanical. Now, we'd like to point out uh, these tips aren't necessarily new features, uh, but they're items that are not always obvious or covered in update seminars or training classes. And uh, I'm going to let Mike finish with the last one there, because this is really Mike's brainchild. Um, you want to say anything else yeah, about this? Basically, like I said, uh, Pat mentioned, we, these are things that you know aren't necessarily new, but they're things that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. Even even the advanced users sometimes aren't aware of some of these things, uh, and they really make life a lot easier when you're just doing your daily work. So we're uh, hoping to share a few with you today. Okay. Okay. So let's go on to tip number one. I'm going to switch over uh, to answers. Uh, mechanical at this point. Uh, we're going to talk about exporting data. So let's bring up uh, a model here. Uh, so I've got a simple uh, section of a, a switch that I formed uh, using some rigid bodies and some contact and plasticity. Uh, so we've run the analysis and we have some result quantities. If, you've ever, if you have ever gone to any result quantity or any analysis that you're, that you're doing here, if you right click on it, you'll see the option to export information. And if you look at the context menu here, uh, you'll see there are several options. One is to export a text file, an STL file, or the ANSYS viewer file, which is something that's new at, at version 18. We'll talk about the first two here. Let's export a text file. Uh, when we choose export text, uh, ANSYS will write a text file with uh, the result quantities and any other information that we have specified using the export options. Now, if I have Excel on the machine, uh, when I save this file, uh, it will also open up Microsoft Excel for me and basically populate the table with the contents of that text file. So pretty simple functionality, but again, one of those things that's kind of hidden in a right mouse button click that 
not everyone is always uh, aware of. So in this case, we've got our node number and our XYZ location, and then the uh, deformation or directional deformation solution for that item. Hey, Pat, when I did this recently, I never got the uh, XYZ location. How did ah, you do that? Well, it's real easy. What you do is you go to Tools, Options, and this is a very important step, Mike, as you mentioned. Go to your Export Options and specify that you want to include the node location because you're going to find that that is not included by default. ANSYS will, with default settings, just simply give you the node number and the result quantity. Now, the nice thing about this options menu is anytime you set any one of these options, it's written to your user profile. So you won't have to do this again for this same revision of ANSYS Mechanical. Good tip. Okay. So that's tip number one. Tip number two uh, is exporting the geometry from Mechanical. So again, right click. Choose the export button, and you have the option to write out an STL file, or a stereo lithography representation of this. So when we write out that STL file, if you're using a, an ANSYS Mechanical Enter Enterprise license, you will have access to the space claim environment. So we'll write out that file. Uh, we'll open up the space claim environment, and now we can simply open up that STL file. Let's see what we end up getting here. Uh, we switch our space file type to STL. There's my form switch file. When we open that up, you see we get a faceted representation of the deformed shape of that model. And when I say faceted representation, you can see that it's basically triangular faces. And that's, that's essentially what an STL file uh, does uh, when that geometry is created. So it's not the original uh, mesh faceting. It's, uh, it's basically the deformed shape with these triangular facets applied to it. Now, once it's in here, we can clean it up with a variety of different tools inside Spaceplane. Uh, one of the easier ones is just to simply convert it to a solid. So we'll go ahead and do that now. And you can see in this case it does a pretty good job of merging a lot of the faces, but we may still need to go back and do some local uh, cleanup and merging uh, in different areas of that geometry. However, once it is inside space plane and converted to a solid that we can use, uh, we then have access to all of the uh, basic space plane functionality. So we can now modify the geometry by pulling or moving uh, or, or changing this switch uh, to something that we can drop back into a, another um, uh, mechanical uh, environment and start to do some further analysis on it. Right, and this, this whole technique with using space claim with the uh, STL file, we uh, documented that and presented this in our uh, version 17 update seminar. Uh, so that, that's also on our website if you want to go look. We, I think we did a reverse engineering. We did, of yeah. a, of a part. Yep, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to just close that for now. And let's get on to tip number three. Well, tip number three is not going to be found in the context menu, the right mouse button menu, uh, but it, it is an ability for us to simply take an updated set of coordinates for this deformed shape into a new mechanical environment. This was something that was introduced at version 17. The te technique for doing this uh, is to go back to the project page and to grab a new, so this is our system right here, our deformed system B. Uh, I'm going to grab a new static structural environment and I'm just going to drop it on the page. And it ended up going to the bottom, which is not where I wanted it to go. Let's try that again. Static structure. Oh, there it is right there. Okay. So notice that there's no geometry, no model. This is essentially a standalone system. And to get the deformed shape from the previous analysis into this as the stress-free geometry, we go to the solution uh, menu or the solution row of the original system, and we bring it down and drag it onto the model row. Okay? When we do that, what we'll see is that the geometry row then disappears. We would need to update the solution, uh, and then we simply edit that model. And I already have it open here, so we don't have to wait for it. And what we see is that we have an updated uh, or stress-free deformed shape uh, of that particular mesh. And we can now start to use that as uh, the geometry for some further analysis. Now, I'm going to caution you, though, that this is the mesh that we're going to be using, this deformed mesh. If you go to the mesh options, you'll see there's no option to clear that mesh, and there's no option to add uh, additional mesh sizing controls. There's some node merging that can be done, but for the most part, the assumption is that you're going to be using the original mesh uh, in this subsequent model of that deformed state. So this would be the same as, as the upcording in the uh, ANSYS class. Yep, yep, and uh, yes, 1992 called Mike, they want their upcord back. So, so anyway, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Uh, we refer to that commonly uh, in the mechanical ABDL environment as 
up courting. We created a verb uh, from a command. Okay. So moving on now to uh, tip number four. Uh, this is something that's been around for quite a while. It's the chart tool that you'll find up on the top of the screen here. Um, I've just started started to use it fairly recently, and the more I use it, the more convenient I find it for, for various items. What what it basically does is allow you to chart items with respect to each other inside the mechanical environment. Previous to this capability, you would have had to export that data separately, bring it into something like Excel, uh, and perform it there. Um, here, what we're going to do today is we're, we're using some rigid bodies and some, joint, uh, <coughs> some joints to basically form this part. And what we'd like to do is look at the force versus displacement uh, from the, the joint loads that we've applied, and that would give us an idea of what the stiffness of what this part is. So the way that we would chart that is to go and select the, the items that we want to plot, in this case the x-axis displacement, so that's that red arrow up on the top there, versus the constraint force, or the amount of force, basically the reaction force from that displacement constraint. Pick the items from the solution folder, click on the chart tool, and then go down to the details menu to uh, describe how you want the chart to appear. So first thing that you'll see is that all of the available items uh, from those two quantities, the, the various uh, forces, X, Y, Z, I have not large deformation turned on here, uh, and then the uh, total force and the relative displacement are all available in tabular form. And now the items in the um, details menu allow us to basically customize how we'd like the display to look. So we're going to go through here and basically say that instead of time on the X axis, we'd like to have the, the X displacement. Uh, the plot types available uh, are the plot symbols can be lines, points, or both. We'll leave it on both. We can do linear uh, and log, semi-log plots. Uh, we can put in axis labels if we want. So this would be displacement. Uh, this would be force. Um, come down. You can put a caption on the top of the chart if you'd like to. Um, so we can do that. Let's just say it's our, it's our chart demo. Spell it right. Uh, and then we specify uh, the items that we'd like to display. So we're omitting time, the static analysis doesn't play a role here, and now we're going to basically chart the, the joint X force versus the X displacement. So I'll just simply omit the items that I'm not interested in seeing in the chart, and that would be the remaining force values. And now here I have uh, basically my displacement along the X axis and my force along the Y axis. If you have multiple items that are unrelated, uh, you're going to see those quantities as normalized, but if you have a simple chart like this where the, uh, the units are obvious, uh, you'll actually chart the, um, the non-normalized or the, the actual uh, quantities for that. So <clears throat> what we've done here, if we look at, go back to our, our joint displacement, uh, we started at zero. Uh, we basically brought it down about a half an inch or 12.7 millimeters. We backed it off to zero and then backed it off an additional half an inch. Uh, when we come down to our chart at the bottom here, see that it, it reflects that. So we start at this point here. This is the loading up of that 12.7 that, that millimeters, backing off the 12.7 meters, meters to zero, and then backing it off an additional um, half an inch or 12.7 at that point. So I've got my chart. I can kind of see the profile of what's happening here as this piece is deforming. Um, and then once again, because it is data that is generated inside mechanical, we can right click and we can export that data further to Excel if we wanted to do any additional post-processing on that. Okay, so uh, I don't know if we mentioned this in the beginning of the webinar, but if you have any questions on anything that we're showing, um, you know, hold them for the moment because we're going to uh, take off the mute at the end of this presentation. Or if you uh, are afraid you're not going to remember the question at the end of the presentation, just simply type it into the chat window um, of the, the WebEx environment and we'll be addressing those at the, the end of this session. Tip number five, uh, user-defined ex result expression. Okay. Well, here's a perfect situation where I'm obviously inducing a fair amount of plasticity, and I'd like to look at the plastic strain components on the part, right? So if I go to the uh, workbench here and I start to look at the available quantities for strain, you know, and this is a classic case where all we see is the equivalent plastic. We're not, we're not going to see the individual components for that. But we know they're available because we know they're written to the ANSYS RST file. Well, this is where our user-defined result comes into play. Now, um, this has been around for quite a while, but what we'd like to show you today is how you can utilize this with respect uh, to the expression worksheet. 
So we input a user-defined result, we do some scoping, like a standard result, and now we need to provide an expression that tells the mechanical environment what data to get from the ANSYS RST file. Now the way that we determine what those expressions are is go to the solution menu, open up the worksheet, and let's scroll this down a little bit so we can see the worksheet better, <clears throat> and we'll see a list of the available expressions for this particular type of element that I'm using for this particular type of analysis. So if you go to a the ANSYS MAPDL help, and you look at the elements, um, this is basically the part of that result output summary, the, the different items that are available. So as we scroll down, uh, you need to know what these expressions mean, so that there needs to be a little bit of mechanical APDL familiarity, or as I mentioned, you're going to go and, and look up these quantities. You can simply do a search on EPDL in the help, and it would do a reverse find for you there. So what we want in this particular case is, uh, we'll just go look at the plastic strain in the X direction. So as I, as I scroll to the end of the row here, it gives me a, an explanation of strain, and that's the expression that I would need to go back and type into the user-defined result. Well, let me stop you there, Pat. Stop me, Mike. Um, you don't need to even type, because I know you're a busy guy. You can actually right-click on there, say create, and it'll automatically so generate that result Automatically for you. defines it for you. Excellent little tip there. Uh, anytime you don't have to type things, especially me with three thumbs, um, I'm going to save myself a lot of user error. So we'll delete the original, we'll evaluate that plastic strain, and there it is. Okay. So, you know, nothing terribly new. The uh, user defined results have been around for a while, but the ability to just go in to that, uh, that worksheet, let's see if I get my workbench or my WebEx window out of the way here, uh, show that worksheet. The ability to, uh, to basically just right click and pull those quantities off automatically is what we found to be a big time saver. That's tip number five. Uh, tip number six, or actually, oh, we have some additional tip number five. Uh, if you notice, uh, that's, the, that's the available solution quantity, so the items that are written to that RST file. Uh, there's some other uh, buttons here that are available that give, give us different listings. The first one is a list result summary. Well, this one's pretty, pretty boring for the most part. I mean, what it does is gives you a tabular list of the items that you've already manually defined in the solution folder. So, you know, not, not terribly exciting, but... Uh, it could come in handy for reporting yeah, purposes. Yeah, that type of thing. Uh, what's of more interest to us is now tip number six, which are these uh, solver component information items that we can utilize. So if we click on that, what we're going to see is a list of essentially the, the attributes that are assigned to the different element types inside of this particular system. So if you're familiar with Workbench, you'll know that for every individual body or mass or contact region in that model, it's going to be assigned a unique set of element attributes. The mat, those element attributes are uh, represented by the mat ID scalar parameter. So if we ever wanted to determine, uh, without using this list, uh, what those IDs were, we could simply put a command block um, into one of the pieces of geometry. So go to the switch here, insert a command block. And it tells us right up at the top here that all the attributes are using this scalar parameter, mat ID. So one way to, to get these items out is you can simply store them by creating your own local parameter. So we'll just call it, you know, part, we'll call it not pat, but part one attribute equals mat ID. And now I've, I've basically stored in the database um, the mat ID that's assigned or the, the set of attribute numbers that's assigned to that particular body. However, if you have a model uh, that's relatively simple, I'll show you a simple case here. Let's go to our multiple systems. Um, we've created a, uh, a simple 2D beam here with a mass on the end. And when we go to the solution items here, and I need to get my WebEx determined to vex me here. When I go to my component information, uh, in this case, I only have one mass in the system. And I want to know what the deformation of that mass is uh, when I apply some gravity and look at the deformation here. So when we talk about solver components um, in the workbench environment, you'll notice that we're seeing the min-max displacement of the finite element entities, but not necessarily the mass that we know to be out in this location here. So if we wanted, to, wanted or needed to know the location of that mass, this is where these solver components will come into play. So let's go back to our worksheet and let's look at the solver component information. And my mass in this particular case is element ID number four. So I'm going to go, come right over here and insert, in this case, a deformation, directional. Uh, instead of geometry selection, we're going to switch this to now solver component. 
And then we're going to list the solver component IDs that we'd like to use for this. In this case, we're only looking at number four for that mass. And we're going to look at the UI deformation. And when we evaluate that, we'll see that the mass is now included in that deformation plot. And the maximum, if you turn on the max here, uh, represents the location of the mass. Okay? So it's a, a, the ability for us to, to pull out that additional information for the items that aren't necessarily available or visible uh, in the standard workbench result. Yeah, and I should point out that, that this uh, was, I think, beta in version 18, and it's available now as a regular feature in 18.1. So this is fairly new. So that's my really simple example of where these components can come into play. But the reason why I have the doctor next to me is so that he can show you uh, a more complex uh, type of information that you can pull out. So we're sw going to switch chairs here, turn the mic over to Mike. Well, uh, another uh, example, as Pat mentioned, there is a, uh, when you're doing this solver component, I happen to be working on a uh, cohesive zone model recently where I was modeling delamination of this. Uh, bilinear uh, the kind of or bimetallic strip here, and uh, so w in this case we're uh, we're prying this apart, and we have interface elements uh, that are modeling uh, a cohesive zone using a co cohesive zone uh, material model and modeling the delamination behavior. So you can see the result here in uh, the basic result in workbench gives us the total deformation, but there's no information about the interface elements as, just like Pat showed you, there was no information of the mass elements and other things uh, of this nature in Workbench. So what we can do, again, is go up to, um, yeah, just drag, drag the window down again. Okay. And go to the worksheet. Go to the worksheet. Right. Away. And then, again, what you can see, a couple things, if I go down to the list solver component information, you see we have this inter, inter 205, that's our interface elements, it's material number five, so that's noted. And then we go under the list available solution quantities, and I know from working with these elements in uh, ANSYS Classic that SSX is the uh, traction on the interface element, so I can right click and say create user defined result. And SDX is the separation of the interface elements in the normal direction, and I can create those two. And then as you do, you come down, we're going to change again the, from the scoping method to solver component, the material ID to number five. Do the same for the separation, so that's solver component, material number five. We evaluate. And what we now see is it's plotting those interface elements uh, only, which is a really nice thing to do if you're doing this type of modeling. Uh, one thing to note here for any of those, any of uh, you out there that use CZM, is that you, you can see that the maximum value, which is about 0.5 megapascals, occurs pretty much right at the tip of where the delamination is starting, and then it's slowly uh, due to the damaging that's occurring due to this bilinear CZM law, the traction gets less until when you get to a, the greenish color, uh, it has it finally failed. Notice the elements, the failed elements there are, still exist. They're just showing uh, essentially zero traction. And you can also look at the amount of, of separation along the interface as well. So that's just another uh, nice way to, that we can now get to things that aren't normally available in, in Workbench. We can now uh, post-process them, animate them, and just like any other uh, quantity. Can I animate this? You can animate this, right? Okay. All right. All right. So I think so we're up to number up seven. To tip number tip seven. seven. Okay. Let me stop animating that. Tip number seven is going to be related to additional solution information that we have available. Um, let me bring up. Uh, a simple example here. Um, we've gone and uh, revived our simple bolted flange example, and we have put an internal pressure on this with a nonlinear contact. So we're opening up a gap. 
Now, the reason, the thing that got me thinking about um, this particular item was I was uh, working with a member of our ANSYS community recently who happens to be in this webinar, uh, and we were discussing uh, fluid pressure penetration, so uh, the technique where we, uh, we place the pressure on the contact elements themselves, uh, and then uh, we'd like to know um, how much load is being basically induced by that pressure as it creeps into the gap. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're interested in more information on fluid, pen fluid pressure penetration, uh, I wrote a, a blog on it fairly recently uh, that describes uh, the methodology that can be used uh, to do that fairly easily. Uh, but let's assume that in this particular case, we've, we've, we've got this pressure, uh, we're, we're basically opening up this gap, and we'd like to, to determine a little bit more information about that. Well, one of the things that was introduced at version 17, and this was pointed out to me by this user, um, that it, it, you can insert contact trackers, by the way, on the fly as of version 17, to look at a variety of pieces of information for any contact region um, as the solution is ongoing. So when we look at the, um, the, the quantities that can be, um, that can be displayed during the solution and monitored, um, in this particular case, one of the ones that we were talking about was the actual fluid pressure. So if you plot that fluid pressure, it wasn't terribly interesting. It just kind of showed the ramping up of the fluid pressure um, along um, <clears throat> basically for the number of substeps that we used. So it was just a simple linear ramp. Uh, but we, we really wanted to know how much force was actually being induced. So I, I dug into this a little bit further, and I found that one of the items um, that you can plot, you got it right here, is the contact area. So if we look at what's happening here, uh, in my first load step, I am putting bolt pretension on. There's no pressure yet. So you can see I'm I'm basically getting a contact area, uh, which, by the way, is going to correlate somewhat to the number of elements that are in contact. Uh, that stays pretty constant um, along that bolt pretension step. And then as we apply the pressure, we start to see that we're losing um, contact area, right? So our gap's opening up, and um, now we're getting some separation. So we could use this contact area calculation in conjunction with the pressure value at that load step to determine how much force is then being applied, how much uh, pressures then creeping into that gap. So, a lot, again, lots of useful items here. Um, again, coming back to the solution information here, um, that those contact trackers, and it, on the fly, you don't need to know what they are up front. Uh, you, can, you can put them in as the solution is ongoing, and you can monitor a whole variety of different pieces of information, of information with respect to those contact uh, regions. And again, I, I would encourage you to kind of scroll through that list uh, and see what's there and, and give a few of these a try. Also, under the solution information, um, if, you're, if you're doing a modal analysis and you need to uh, extract from the solution information uh, the participation factors and the modal masses, you know, they are summarized in the output file, uh, but they're kind of difficult to get at. You, have, you basically have to open this up in a text editor and, and paste those quantities out. Well, if you look down under the details of the solution information for a modal analysis, you'll see that your options are solver output, but also a nice participation factor summary table. So it's already gone and done that for us. It's basically taken that information from the output file, placed it in a table where it's very easy for us to, to basically select a set of cells, copy, and then uh, paste these into uh, either another table or just simply get a screen capture of that participation factor table to put in, in, in any kind of reporting that we need to do. So again, another one of those little items, I just discovered this one about a week and a half ago. Um, it was shown to me by Eric here in our office. Uh, he walked in on me and I, and I was busily digging things out of the alpha file and he said, why the heck are you doing that? Just, just come over here and, and click on the, on the summary and you've got a nice table that you can pull those quantities from. So another nice little time saver that we encountered and thought we had in here. So that is uh, tip number eight, and now we're getting into tips nine and ten. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike, and he is going to talk to you about the fatigue tool. Right. So uh, I do want to take this uh, point to say that I'm not going, going to, since we're getting near, nearing the end here, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this other than to tell you that uh, in August, the next e-learning will be me talking about the fatigue tool. So if you want to get more information on the fatigue tool, uh, I'll be hitting that uh, next month. Um, but for now, I can at least, uh, as a, basically the tip today is to show you that you have um, 
if you uh, let's say are have are running uh, version 18 and have a mechanical license, the fatigue tool is available to you. So you have the, the real tip is it is available and you can use it. So there's a, uh, a couple things that we uh, should. Um, where are we going here? I, okay, I wanted to first go into the engineering data. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so first off, when you're doing the fatigue tool, it assumes that you have fatigue data. And very quickly, just wanted to point out that in uh, built into ANSYS, uh, you have limited amount of data. I believe it's, uh, you, you can get some fatigue data that's built in from structural steel and aluminum. That's about it. Anything other than that, you're going to need to uh, in, import it or create it yourself. But you can see, for example, structural steel, if we highlight the, uh, the stress life, uh, for example, here we're showing cycles uh, versus alternating stress uh, for a mean stress of zero, so that's a fully reversed loading. And so you can see that we have SN data uh, that's already built in. So you would need that in order to uh, access the, the fatigue tool. So if we go back to uh, mechanical, um, you know, what you can do, of course, is, is you can just um, add a fatigue tool. So I'll, you right-click on solution. So we'll, let's first look at this uh, simple model. Um, we have a situation here on this, uh, this part where we're going, going to have a cyclic load at the top. It's fixed at the other end. And what we kind of know from performing the analysis and looking at the stress is we have a maximum value in this little whole region here uh, that's showing where our maximum stress, so that's probably where the life would be limited in this case. So what we can do is we can right click and say insert uh, fatigue, fatigue tool, and that will insert the fatigue tool. And if you go down to the to details, we have to just fill in a few things. Uh, there's just very quickly the strength factor. That's just to account for uh, many things that will uh, knock down the, you know, you put a safety factor in there. So we're going to put a 0 0.8 uh, for that. We're going to do a zero based loading uh, with the scale factor of 2. What we're basically saying is the loads are going to go from zero to twice the amount. So we're going to have a mean stress uh, in this where it's not going to be going around a uh, mean stress of zero. And that mean stress will obviously have an effect on life. And in order for that to have an effect, we have to add a mean stress theory here. So we're going to change that to a Goodman, for example. And at that point, uh, under the fatigue tool, we, need to, we can insert a bunch of different things. And we'll be discussing these in next month's uh, e-learning. But for now, I'm just going to add life. And I'll also add a damage. Under uh, damage, you can put what your design life is, and it'll give you basically a factor of, you know, of where you are in relation to your design life. So let's make it a million cycles as the design life that we're shooting for. And if I evaluate these results, uh, you can see that our life is about two and a half million uh, cycles, and that's again, as we knew, would be uh, right in that uh, poorly positioned hole that's in this part. And then under damage, uh, you can see that we're at uh, the max damage is about a 0.4. Again, under one is good. It means you've met your, uh, because we were going for a million cycles, we have two and a half million. If that number is above one, that would mean we w wouldn't have met uh, our design life. So that's basically, it just wanted to, uh, you know, very briefly show you that the fatigue tool is available, and we're going to get into more uh, information on that. I mean, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer it, but, uh, you know, we are going to be doing an e-learning uh, coming up. And then, finally, I'm going to uh, transition why I have the mic away from, you know, wrestled it away from Pat. I'm going to uh, do tip 10 as well. And tip 10 is another one of these things where it's, it's uh, it's a very general tip. It's you can use ACT extensions for post-processing. And uh, for those of you, I think uh, you uh, understand, uh, most of you know that ACT 
is a, a way to customize ANSYS in order to do things that aren't available uh, in uh, the GUI, uh, and, and you can uh, basically design it to do anything you want. Um, so I'm going to drag yeah, over. Just this presentation button. Oh. Presentation. Okay. Here. Okay, so just real quickly, uh, this just came up recently with a, a, a user that they didn't really have fatigue data. All they knew was the ultimate strength of the material they were using and the endurance limit, and they kind of wanted to know if fatigue was going to be an issue with their part. And so what is commonly done is uh, we use a Goodman diagram, as shown on the pictures here. The blue line is just basically connecting a mean stress of the endurance limit with a alternating stress uh, of the ultimate stress and, um, and, and connecting those. Uh, oh, I, I said that wrong. It's the mean stress is the ultimate stress and the alternating stress is the endurance limit. You draw a line, that's your Goodman line, and then you can look at the mean versus alternating stress at any part of your model. And if the point falls below the Goodman line, it is not fatigue uh, sensitive. And if it's, if it's uh, beyond the line, past the, you know, beyond this envelope here, then you have fatigue issues that you need to further take a look at. And not only is it good to know where the point lines up in your model, but also sometimes it's nice to get an idea of what the ratio is of how far away it is from the Goodman line. And as this PowerPoint shows, you can look at the alternating ratio, the mean ratio, or even a proportional ratio of how far you are. So, in order to do this, we just uh, basically wrote a ACT extension to do this. So if I click my little uh, Goodman ratio plot, because I added an ACT extension here, and I'm going to scope this to all the bodies, it automatically, the, uh, by the way, the, uh, it'll, this Goodman ratio will go in and grab an endurance limit and ultimate stress if it's available for any of the materials in your model. We have steel here, so it went and grabbed those. But you can type these in again. It's you know 86 megapascals is the endurance limit, and let's say 460 is the ultimate stress. And then we're going to do the Goodman based on the alternating ratio. So we want to look at uh, where the point is in relation to the Goodman diagram. And uh, at this end, you can set an R ratio. We're going to set an R ratio of of zero for this, so we're going to use result quantity one with an R ratio of zero. And if we evaluate that, what you get is a contour plot of this Goodman ratio at every point in your model where the maximum value, again, occurring in our hole that we kind of knew was going to be our critical region. And you can see that this Goodman ratio is 0.4, so it means that, that the maximum uh, ratio value on our Goodman diagram is at this whole location, and it's about 40% of the way to the Goodman uh, line, which in this case would say for this particular psychic loading, without doing a full-blown uh, fatigue analysis, we feel pretty safe that uh, you know this isn't a fatigue uh, issue that we have to worry about. So that's just an, an example of using ACT extensions for post-processing, you can basically design them to do uh, anything you want. And again, we'll, there, I believe there's going to be an e-learning on ACT extensions coming up later this year. 